Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this seminar series on what we call Biblical Christian Zionism. I'd like to read two passages of Scripture for you before we dive into our subject for discussion today. The first one is Genesis chapter 17 and verse, verses 7 to 8. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession and I will be their God. And then the next passage that we will read from is found in the book of Psalms and in particular, Psalm 105 and verses 7 to 12. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance when they were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in it. So today we will be discussing the basis of biblical Christian Zionism. And this, in fact, is the Abrahamic covenant. And we've just read the promises that pertain to this covenant from the book of Genesis. This covenant, as we shall see later in greater depth, is the greatest of the covenants in the Bible since it constitutes God's decision to save the world from sin through the agency of the Jewish people. Now that's important for us to understand. The Abrahamic covenant is the greatest covenant in the whole of the Bible because it constitutes God's decision to save the world through the agency of the people of Israel. It is, as we've seen, an everlasting covenant, which was at one point conditional upon Abraham's obedience to the test of God. You will remember that when God came to Abraham and he said, you take your only son, uh, the son that was born well beyond their age of bearing children. And before Isaac had even had children, God said, you take him and you kill him. And Abraham obeyed. What a wonderful story that is. We will say more about that later. So the covenant was conditional upon Abraham's obedience to that remarkable test through which God put him. And we know today that Abraham passed that test and consequently God called him his friend, his special friend. And you will find that, free, that refrain throughout the Bible. After Abraham passed that test, the God of the Bible affirmed that henceforth, from that day forward, the covenant would be unconditional and it would be everlasting. Zionism then is the belief that the land of Canaan is the everlasting possession of the Jewish people. The Abrahamic covenant validates, confirms, and substantiates this claim. Therefore, the land of Canaan became what we can call the springboard for God's plan of world redemption. 
the means by which he would reach the whole world with his saving message. And uh, the modern day restoration then of Israel, given that the Abrahamic covenant is everlasting and totally now unconditional, the modern day restoration of Israel in our time is certainly evidence of God's faithfulness to that promise that he gave to Abraham some 4,000 years ago. When God came to Abraham, he was living in Ur of the Chaldees. And the Bible tells us that God gave to him a threefold call for the sake of world redemption. There were three things that God required from Abraham. So now the story is a very interesting one because our friend Abraham was not a Chaldean. In fact, he was a Sumerian. He lived in Ur of the Chaldees and we understand that God came to him because of the fall of humankind. In Genesis chapter 3, we have a record of man's rebellion against God. And from then onwards, we have a progressive downward plunge of the human race away from God. Not simply in terms of space, in that God had ejected them from the Garden of Eden, but also a distance from God in terms of character. Our very basic human natures actually became sinful and wicked and were nothing like God originally desired or intended. So by the time we get to Genesis chapter 11, the truth is very clear. Man is without God in the world. More than that, he is lost. And more than that, he is doomed. And more than that, he cannot find his way back to God. The Bible actually says that the natural man does not desire the things of God. And actually, neither can he. He is so damaged by the fall and by the wickedness of his nature that there's nothing within him that seeks to return to God. It is at this point in our tragic human history, 4,000 years ago, that God broke into the life of Abraham and called him to leave Ur of the Chaldees and to go out and follow him to a land that he would show him. It is a remarkable story. It is the very dawn of world redemption. And it's interesting because it tells us that God came looking for us. Sometimes people say that we found God or we found Jesus. Well, that's not true because Jesus was never lost. The truth is that God came looking for us. And he did so in the most peculiar fashion in that he did it by arriving on the doorstep of this man called Abraham. And then he gave him a threefold call by which he would fulfill the purpose of God to save you and me and people from every tribe, from every tongue and from every nation. So let's look at this threefold call. The first thing that God required from Abraham and the people that, we would, that would come from him, known ultimately as the people of Israel, is that God gave Abraham a birthing call. And we read about that in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. Listen to these words. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In other words, Abraham, I'm going to do something in you and through you. I'm going to birth something 
out of your life and the family that comes from you that is going to bring huge blessing to the world. In Paul's epistle to the Galatians, he tells us that that blessing must be understood as salvation or redemption. So God gave to Abraham a birthing call. And how wonderful it is to know today that everything we hold dear as Christian people, everything we love, and even the God that we serve is actually Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. The Word of God is a Jewish document. The prophets and the apostles and all the things uh, that have to do with salvation in terms of the glory of God and the great covenants, these, my friends, are all Jewish, every single one of them. And Jesus recognized that. When speaking with his detractors, we are told in the gospel according to John that he said to them that salvation actually is of the Jews. And he used the word in the plural, not the singular. Now we know that ultimately, and even Jesus knew it, that it was his death, his burial, and his resurrection alone that actually will save us. But he also recognized that he stood on the shoulders of many great men of God, Jewish prophets, Jewish apostles, Jewish priests, Jewish covenants. And it was these that validated his ministry and gave him credentials. So the Apostle Paul, recognizing that same truth, says the following in Romans chapter 9 and reading from verse 1. I tell the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, and of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. So even the God we serve in the person of Jesus has a Jewish identity. How incredible. And this was what the nation of Israel has birthed for each and every one of us. We can say that the nation of Israel became God's amplification system, the means by which he would speak his message to the world. Thank God for Abraham and his people. Now, the second call that God placed over Abraham was in fact a suffering call. First, a birthing call and then a suffering call. And we find that in Genesis chapter 15, where the Abrahamic covenant is once again affirmed, but this time telling our friend Abraham something more of what he would have to do for the sake of the world. And this is the record of the actual day when God cuts or, as the Bible teaches us, makes this covenant with Abraham. We pick it up in Genesis chapter 15 and we read from verse 9. So, he, that is God, said to Abraham, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Now this is quite incredible contextually because this is the day when God is entering into a covenant with Abraham that in the end would deliver millions of people into the great and wonderful mansions of heaven. So you would imagine that this would be a glorious day 
filled with absolute peace and joy and uh, just a magnificent sense of the presence of God. But that's not what happened. We find that Abraham prepares uh, the ritual pieces of animals for this covenant. And when he's completed that task, the Bible says that two things happen. First of all, vultures come down out of the heavens. And secondly, he falls into a sleep and he has a nightmare. The Bible says great horror filled his soul. How strange. Well, firstly, let me talk to you about the vultures. The vultures here described are actually the same vultures that you find in Africa. I have seen them many times. And um, these are predators. And these are fairly big birds and they hunt in flocks. And they are very vicious. They will actually tear you apart. When I went on my honeymoon with my wife, we went to a game reserve in South Africa. And I remember the day when we turned a corner in the bush and we came upon a lion kill. And there was this lioness eating on a deer that she had pulled down. And over, over above were a flock of vultures. Now there's a pecking order in the animal kingdom in terms of who gets to feast when and how. First the lion and then possibly uh, the cheetah, the leopard and the hyena. And finally the vultures get to come down and uh, scavenge as they tear the remaining parts of the carcass to pieces. But on this particular day, there was a vulture that had decided that the lioness had spent too long eating on this glorious feast. And out of the blue, without any warning, this vulture came diving out of the sky to attack the lion. I shall never forget it because I took a photograph of it. The lion jumped up with his paw in order to defend himself from the vulture and in an attempt to sweep the vulture out of the sky as it came near to the lion. My friends, the truth is that these vultures were there to kill Abraham. They smelt blood. And they wanted to dismember him. So they came down. And Abraham was in fact fighting for his life. And once he had defended the animal pieces and his own life, exhausted, he fell asleep. And then he had this terrible dream. What was the point of this? Why did God allow this? Well, he did so to enforce upon the mind of Abraham and his children that if they became the vehicle of world redemption, if Abraham agreed to become the vehicle through which God would save the world, then from that day forward, he and the children that come from him, the Jewish people, would be under constant attack from the vulture in an attempt to annihilate them, to destroy them, and to wipe them off the face of the earth. And that's why the vultures attacked him. And that's why he had the sense of nightmare. The Bible tells us further down in this passage that as he had this dream, he saw a torch passing through the sacrificial pieces and also an oven, a bronze oven, and in that symbolism, we have the call of God over Israel. Number one, a birthing call to give to the world the revelation of God's wonderful salvation embodied in his word and in his Messiah, the Lord Jesus. But the burning oven was a reminder that from that day forward, they would endure the oven of persecution and burning. What a picture given the reminder of what the Nazi Holocaust did, actually burned the Jews in their hundreds and thousands and millions in ovens. Why? Because they carried in their national destiny, 
the message of eternal salvation. It's easy. Liquidate the Jews from Abraham's day onwards and God's plan to save you and me is actually frustrated. So God gave to Abraham the truth. He would have a birthing call and he would have a suffering call over the lives of his children. And then there's another call that God gave to Abraham. And this is the most amazing and humbling of all. And that's recorded in the book of Genesis chapter 22. And we call this a priestly call. God gave to Abraham a birthing call, a suffering call, and then a priestly call. And this is the record of which I spoke earlier when God told Abraham to take his only son, Isaac, upon whom all the future promises and blessings of God rested. And God said, take him and kill him. Take him to Mount Moriah and there kill him. And we pick up the story in Genesis chapter 22. And uh, and we read in verse 5 following when they got to Mount Moriah, which actually is in Jerusalem. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the word, the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire, the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. What an image. You wonder what a father must have thought. And more than that, how would God fulfill the promises he made to him if his son was to be killed in this manner? So the Bible says that Abraham put wood on Isaac's back and they went to the pinnacle of Mount Moriah. It says then that he laid Isaac on the wood and then it says that he lifted up his hand and he killed him. Now, of course, I know that you know, as I will do, that the Bible says that an angel from heaven stopped him. But the truth is, that he killed him in his heart and just not with his hand. That is, Abraham was totally obedient to God. Isaac was dead. The only thing that stopped that was the movement of Abraham's hand. And when God saw that Abraham had such obedience, this is the point when this covenant The Abrahamic covenant no longer was conditional, but unconditional forever. Now, something amazing happened to Abraham. The Bible affirms that he received Isaac back from the dead. In the book of Hebrews, it actually says that validating the fact that in his heart he had killed him, but he received him back from the dead. And in all of this picture, something amazing happened in that the presence of God came down upon him. And we are told that he was transported by the power of the Holy Spirit into 2,000 years in the future. And when he opened his eyes, he found himself at exactly the same place. Only now there was a city there. 
they were walls and there were hundreds of thousands of people because they were celebrating some type of festival about which at this point he did not know anything. But he stood outside the walls of Jerusalem and on his left there was a rocky outcrop and it had the form of a skull. It was actually part of Mount Moriah. And as he stood there, he heard a tumult coming from one of the gates. And it got louder. He heard screaming. He heard, he heard all sorts of abuse and blasphemy. And then he saw that people spilled out of the gate. And there were Roman soldiers and there were some people standing quietly by weeping. Others were cursing. And he noticed that the object of their cursing was an individual who had on his back wood. And as he looked at this individual, he noticed that he was bleeding everywhere. He had been so abused. His rib cage was open. And he had blood pouring down his cheeks. A crown of thorns was rammed upon his head. And uh, Abraham watched as this individual, under the weight of the cross, staggered toward him. And he, he watched as he fell. And he fell into the dirt and he spittle and his dust mingled together. And the people laughed and some scoffed and the Bible says some spat on him. And the Roman soldiers, they poked the butt of their spears into him, egging him on. And Abraham looked between the feet and to his surprise, he saw the face of Isaac. And he watched as Isaac dragged that crossbeam to the place of execution. And he stood there and he watched as they put him on the wood just as he had done. And how they had lifted him between heaven and earth and rammed the crossbeam down so that his whole body tore. And Abraham watched and the scene became dramatic. The whole world was darkened. There was thunder and lightning and blood ran down with the water from this cross. And as he looked and he saw Isaac, suddenly the face of Isaac changed and it became that of his great, 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 great grandson, Jesus of Nazareth. And as Abraham looked upon this terrible scene, we are told that he was not filled with rage. He didn't tear his clothes in remorse. The Bible says that a great joy fell upon him and he spun around in the dirt with the rain and the thunder and the mud and the blood pouring down from the cross. And he lifted his hands to heaven and he began to worship God because he knew that he was gazing upon the dawn of world redemption. And he understood for the first time that the call that God placed over his life was incredible. To birth redemptive products for the world, to suffer in order to bring the world a Messiah. And thirdly, to give to the world a suffering Messiah who would take away their sins and give them eternal life. So where does the Bible say that Abraham saw all of this? I've coloured it in, but it says it. In John chapter 8 and verse 56, we read this as Jesus spoke to his detractors. This is what he said. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. So when did Abraham see the day of Jesus, meaning the day of his death, that filled him with such joy 
It was the day that in his heart he sacrificed Isaac. And God revealed to him the mystery of a priestly call from Israel would come a Messiah who would save the world. My dear friends, the Bible teaches that the Jews did kill Jesus. It says it time and time again in the book of Acts. Even the apostolic preachers said it time and time again. But actually, with a provision, and it's this provision that people have forgotten, and that is that they killed him in ignorance. They did not know what they were doing. But in so doing, they fulfilled the call of God in Abraham to them to give to the world the death of Christ and salvation. This is amazing and it teaches us how indebted we are to the Jewish people that they should have carried in their national destiny such a remarkable, remarkable and fearful call because in fulfilling this, they've been accused of being Christ killers, the killers of God, and they've been murdered by the vulture throughout history. But the Bible says they are not Christ killers. And even Peter, when he preached just after the day of Pentecost, affirmed that they did it in ignorance. Listen to the word of God in Acts chapter 3. This is the record of the lame man who was healed at the gate beautiful. And Peter and John raise him up in the name of Jesus. And then we find this statement in Acts chapter 3, where Peter begins to preach, a big crowd having gathered. And he says to them, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and, and asked, for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Oh. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers, the people and the rulers. They did it as a high priest is blindfolded and they gave to the world the death of Christ. All because of the Abrahamic covenant that promised them the land of Canaan is an everlasting possession and the springboard from which eternal salvation rooted in the death of Christ would come to the world. He does not upbraid them. He actually quietens them down. He assures them, you did this in ignorance. And in fact, then he says, the, vexed, the very next verse, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus Christ who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. We've witnessed in our day the final return of the Jewish people to the land that God gave to them in the Abrahamic covenant. 
This return is the beginning of the restoration of all things. And the Bible says that this process of restoration unfolding in Israel today will culminate with their spiritual recovery and the return of Jesus to the Mount of Olives. Yes, it's true. They have returned to birth again the last great event in human history vouched for by the Abrahamic covenant, the second coming of Jesus. Amen. Like everywhere else, Israel has been hit by the coronavirus. You come here to Ben Gurion Airport and you see that there are very few planes in and out of the country. But the few that are coming are bringing Jews on them from all around the world who are desperate to make Aliyah to Israel. They see Israel as safer, as having a, a better economic potential for the future for them. And Israeli officials have managed to bring evacuation flights even amidst all the corona travel bans. And it's exciting to report that the Christian embassy has brought over a thousand Jews on these rescue flights over the past four months. Since February, every month around 250 Jews coming home to Israel on flights sponsored by the Christian Embassy. And we want to challenge you to help us keep up this pace in the coming months that we bring at least 250 Jewish people home on Aliyah flights. You can go to our, our site on.icej.org slash rescue250 and you can help book a seat for some Jewish family to come home. The flights that are coming now are bringing Jews who are stuck in limbo. They thought they were going to make Aliyah this year and they left their jobs, they uh, sold their apartments and all of a sudden Corona hit and many of them have been destitute. We've also had cancer patients who needed to get to Israel for life-saving surgery many emergencies. Help us with our Rescue 250 campaign, bringing at least 250 Jews home despite the corona. You can be part of this remarkable story that even amid the coronavirus, all the Bible prophecies about the Jewish people coming back to the land of Israel in the last days, it is still happening. Nothing has been able to stop it, but we need your help. Go to our site, and help book a flight for a Jewish family today.